So, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, as we're continuing our study through the book of Revelation, and as we're trudging our way through this second portion of the book, chapters 2 and 3, we're finally looking at Jesus' words to the seventh church in Asia that he writes to here in these two chapters. And here in chapter 3, we're looking right now at verses 14 through 22 as Jesus addresses the lukewarm church in Laodicea. And so we want to pick up our study tonight. We're going to pick up actually in verse 17, but I want to go back to verse 14 and grab this in context. And so Jesus instructs John to write these letters to the seven churches in Asia. And in verse 14, Jesus says, And to the angel, or the messenger, or most likely he's speaking of the pastor of the church, of the Laodiceans. And so the church at Laodicea um, is the seventh and final church that Jesus is addressing here. And you know, you've heard the old saying, right? You save the best for last. Well, Jesus saved the worst for last, actually. Um, and you're going to see that as we continue to go through his letter here to those at Laodicea. Uh, I've pointed out, if you notice, that it says of the church of the Laodiceans. Uh, that's how it's translated in both the King James and the New King James. I think that is, again, very um, significant that it doesn't say, as it does in the six previous letters, to the church or of the church in Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum, all the other places that uh, the church was located where Jesus wrote to, but the church of Laodiceans. And the reason for that is because this church literally has become the people's church. It's, it's, it, ultimately, it's the Lord's church. He's addressing it. He's speaking to them. He's going to call on them at the end of the letter to repent. But it's important to understand that this is a church that literally has put Jesus outside and you see that down in verse 20 when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Jesus is pictured here, or picturing himself, giving us the idea that he's on the outside of the church, longing to come back into the church. Um, and that word Laodicean uh, literally means the people who rule or ruled by the people. And so this has become, instead of literally the church of Jesus Christ, has become the church of the Laodiceans. And so that's a very sad uh, indictment upon this church. But here in verse 14, in the second half of the verse, as Jesus does in all the letters, he gives a clear description of himself that is pertinent to his words to this church. And the description of himself, of course, comes from chapter 1. Notice what he says. He says, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. And so what Jesus is telling us here as he's speaking to the Laodiceans, he's revealing himself as the Amen, which means he is both the beginning and the end. You'll find that back in chapter 1. He's also the faithful and true witness. Faithful means trustworthy. True means real or authentic. In other words, he's trustworthy and he's dependable, and he's the witness who came from God to witness the truth to us, to give us the truth. And so we've talked about that, and also the fact that he calls himself the beginning of the creation of God tells us that he is God himself. He's not saying he's the first being that God created, but rather he is the creator. Uh, that word, create, or the, the word beginning here is the Greek word arche, which means the origin or the source of. And we've looked at all that in depth. Jesus is the origin. Um, he is the source of all creation. He's the one who created it. Uh, it's that word that gives us our English word architect. So Jesus is the one who has designed everything and brought it into being through his word. And so as we look at those three descriptions he gives of himself, the amen means that Jesus is the final word. The fact that he is the faithful and true witness means he is the reliable word. 
And the fact that he is the beginning of the creation of God means that he is the first word. So if you go back to Genesis or go back to Revelation chapter 1, you'll see the reason why he said, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so that's what he's drawing upon here. Now, in verse 15, and we looked Sunday at verses 15 and 16, but in verse 15, he makes his confession to this church as he does to all the churches and saying, I know your works. In other words, Jesus sees what's going on in the church and he's aware of what's happening in the church and in everyone in the church. And in this particular church, he now here in verse 15 does the opposite of what he did in his last letter to the faithful church of Philadelphia. It's interesting because Jesus now will begin in verse 15 instead of giving a word of commendation, instead of telling the church what they did right, if you look at the other letters, you will see this is what Jesus did at this point in each letter. He gives them a word of commendation. Before he tells them what's wrong with their church, and in their church, he tells them what is right. And what's interesting is, in the last letter he wrote to the church at Philadelphia, he had nothing, no words of correction to say to them. He had nothing negative to say to them. All he had was words of commendation. Here's what's right with your church. Here, he does just the opposite. Here, he has no words of commendation. He literally has nothing good to say about these believers at Laodicea. And that's why he goes straight here in verse 15 to words of correction or words of condemnation. He starts off here by saying, here is what is wrong with you all. <laughs> and, it's, and it's very sad. It's a very sad letter. But notice in verse 15, I know your works, and here how he, here's how he starts his words of correction or condemnation, which will take us from verse 15 through verse 17. He says, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, you are tepid, you're in the middle, you're not hot nor cold, he says... Because of that, I will vomit you out of my mouth. He's literally telling this church, because you're lukewarm, you make me sick. There's nothing about you I can swallow. I have to spit it all out. And as we talked about Sunday, I'm not going to get into it because we exhausted it on Sunday. So if you weren't here Sunday, I would encourage you to listen to the teaching from Sunday. What does he mean when he tells them, that you're lukewarm, and I wish, or I could wish, that you were cold or hot. What he's literally telling them is this. Because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, you are useless. You're useless. And what we looked at Sunday, if you remember, is when does a church become useless? A church becomes useless when it's no value to the Lord anymore. And when does that happen? It happens when a church becomes so internal and inward that it fails to glorify God in the world as being salt and light. When the church no longer is concerned about glorifying God and about taking the gospel to people and living the gospel in front of people and preserving through righteous living, the society they live in, and not being concerned with living a life that is one that shines brightly, as light does in darkness, when we become so internal and about ourselves that that happens, that congregation is useless to the Lord Jesus. He has us here on this earth to be his witnesses. He has us here to be salt and to be light, to be influence, to influence our society, 
with the gospel, with the word of God, with holy living. And he's called us to live that life in the middle of the darkness so that people can see the light of Jesus in us. Literally so they can see him instead of seeing us. And Jesus says when we do that, when we are salt, then we have the, we have the ability then to be light. What happens when we do that is then God is glorified. But when we're not concerned about that in our life and all we're concerned about in the church is just our four walls, us four and no more. Or as individual Christians, all we're concerned about is making sure I have a comfortable living and I have everything I need and everything I want and, you know, my relationship with God, you know, is, you know, secondary or third or fourth down the line and my relationship with God is all predicated on my comfort and my convenience. I mean, when we've become like that as Christians, we're useless. We're useless to the Lord individually, and we're useless to Him as a church. And that is what He's saying here. Okay? What He's, again, I shared this Sunday, what He's not saying is, I would rather you be hot for me, in the sense of fervent for me and all of that, or I'd rather you be stone cold toward me. That is not what Jesus is saying here. What he is saying is to be lukewarm means to be useless. And so, in verse 17 now, he tells us here how a church becomes useless. How did the church of Laodicea deserve words like this from Jesus? And he tells us, beginning in verse 17. And really what it all comes down to is that one ugly word that really is the foundation to every sin that all of us commit. And that's the word pride. If you ever notice in the English, now I'm not saying this is inspired or anything, I just think it's interesting. The word pride, in the, right in the middle of it is the letter I. And the middle letter to the word sin is I. You see in a pattern there? When it all becomes all about the Holy Trinity, me, myself, and I, then we become useless to the Lord. And so, in addressing this now, he's going to continue here his words of correction toward them, his words of condemnation. Here's what's wrong. He says, you're useless because you say. And notice what he says here. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. So not only are they useless, but they are prideful. That's what's happening. And so let's break this down. Notice he says, because you say. See those words you say there? Very interesting words, because what it literally means is this. You allege. You allege. In other words, what they are saying when they say, I am rich, we've become wealthy, and we're in need of nothing, Jesus is saying those words are not based on fact, but rather they express the flawed opinion that the church at Laodicea had of themselves. They're saying something that's not true. Now, they believe it because they're deceived by their pride. But Jesus says, let me share something with you here that you're not aware of. You say, you allege, you believe that you're rich, you're wealthy, you have need of nothing. And so Jesus says, this isn't the case. And this is interesting because this is something in the New Testament that the, that the Apostle Paul deals with in a couple different places and different passages in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul warns us as believers not to do this, okay? Not to be prideful in saying things about ourselves that are not true, okay? Of having an, an inflated opinion of our own selves, let me give you one of them. Well, I'll give you two, but let me give you this one first. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. As Paul was getting ready to 
encourage the church at Rome to use their spiritual gifts for the benefit of the church? Paul says, for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Soberly. So you could say when you're full of pride, you're spiritually drunk. And trust me, there's a lot of Christians who are drunk on themselves. Okay? And how do you know? Just listen to them talk after a while. All they will talk about is, again, the, whole, the unholy trinity, right? Me, myself, and I. And so Paul's words here are very instructive to us. When Paul said to think of himself more highly than he ought to think that he shouldn't do this, what that means is to fall into self-deception. Paul says that when we do that, we are believing we are something when we're not. And self-deception not only leads us to believe that we're something when we're not, but it also leads us to believe we're more than we really are. So whatever it is we really are, it leads us to believe, no, I'm more than that. And that was the problem with the church at Laodicea. Now, what's interesting is in the Greek where Paul says this, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, here's what it literally means in the Greek. It literally means don't get hyper about yourself. Don't be hyper about yourself. See, when we get hyper about ourselves, we deceive ourselves, and we fall into the same snare and sin that Satan himself fell into in the very beginning in heaven. And that is pride. It's pride. And so Paul says, be careful not to do this. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Then how are we supposed to think of ourselves? Paul says to think soberly. Soberly. Now, literally, that word means what it sounds like. Literally, to not be drunk on ourselves. But the word soberly literally means to have a sane estimation of oneself. It means to have a mind that's sane. And it's, it means to have a sane and an honest estimation of oneself. Thinking soberly means that we see ourselves not as others see us, or not even seeing ourselves as we see ourselves, but it's seeing ourselves the way God sees us. Okay? And in fact, in Psalm 139, this is exactly what David asks the Lord to do for him. Let me share it with you. Psalm 139, at the very end of the psalm, David says this. David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. Now, what's interesting is if you look at that psalm and go back to the beginning of it, it starts out much the same way, except it says this. David says in verse 1 of Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. So in the very beginning of the psalm, he starts it off by saying, Lord, you have searched me and have known me. And then he'll talk about God's attributes. He'll talk about how God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. And then he'll end it by saying, Now, Lord, search me and know me. Try my heart. So why does David do that? Why does David at the beginning say, you have searched me and you know me, and at the end, when he talks about how great God is, he then says, now, search me and know me. The reason he does that is because he's asking God to show him what God already knows about him. Why? Because it is natural for us to have an inflated opinion of ourselves. It's only natural. And I can prove it to you. Listen, if you ever are handed 
a group picture where you're included in the group, when you get the picture, who's the first person you look for? Me, right? Or your spouse or your neighbor? No, you. Why? Because we want to see if our eyes are closed. We want to see if we're smiling. We want to see how good we look. Does my hair look good? How do I look in the picture? We're, we're just all about us. Each one of us naturally already have an inflated opinion of ourselves. We, we think of ourselves way too much and too highly of ourselves and even more than we are. And so from time to time, it is important for us to get along with the Lord and to pray what David prayed. Lord, would you search me and know me and try me and show me what you know about me. Why? So that if I need to repent, I can repent. If I need to confess sin, I can confess sin. If I need to get in line with your way, then I can do that. Okay, Because it's very easy for us to walk in pride and to think that we're more than we are. So what David was asking for here was an honest estimation of himself. Now, one man by the name of C.H. McIntosh years ago wrote this. He said, to be, lo- to be left alone with God is the only true way of arriving at a just knowledge of ourselves and our ways. The only way to really know what is in us and who we truly are is to get alone with the Lord. Because as long as we're around people, we can always find someone else that's worse off than us. And when we measure ourselves with ourselves, with one another, we tend to find people who are worse off than us, measure ourselves to them, and we always look really good. But when you're alone with the Lord... The Holy Spirit has a way of being able then to speak to you and to really show you what he knows about you. And when he does, that should lead us to a place of saying, Lord, I I want to change. I want to come in line with your will and with what you want instead of me and myself and what I want, you see. So... Their problem here was pride. Paul also said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, he said this. He said, for if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So again, here's this issue of self-deception. Whenever we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, and we think of ourselves more than we actually are, What happens is self-deception sets in. When self-deception sets in, then pride sets in because we're believing something about ourselves that's not true. And the only way to cure that is to get alone with the Lord and His Word and to let His Holy Spirit speak to us and reveal things to us and show us these things. So, again, the problem with the church at Laodicea is Jesus isn't on the inside of the church. He's on the outside. This church is all about them. And that was the problem. They were full of pride. And we're going to see this even more in the rest of our study tonight and Sunday as we continue this section. So notice here in verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 17. Jesus says, because you say, I am Rich. Do you see that? See those words, I am? Very important words in Scripture. When Jesus used those words, I am, what he was indicating to them was their spirit of independence and self-sufficiency. Jesus was saying that they were saying, I am rich. Do you see that? In saying what they said, I am rich, and then, as they said, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, they were saying, Lord, we don't need you. We have everything we need. We're doing just fine with you outside the church. That's what they're saying. So these words, I am, indicate their independent spirit. And what I mean by independent independent is independent of the Lord and His presence. 
and it's an indication of their own self-sufficiency. Now, again, who does this remind us of? Those words, I am, okay, remind us of Satan himself. Satan is the first being who committed sin, and he did so in heaven. So the first sin wasn't commit, committed by man on earth. Now, man's original sin was committed by Adam in the Garden of Eden, and that's why we all are sinners, because we're, we've come from Adam. We've inherited his sinful nature. But the first sin actually occurred in heaven and occurred by Satan. And why did it happen? Because of his pride. He became self-deceived in thinking he was something when, when he was nothing, in thinking more of himself than he should have. And how do we know that? Well, Isaiah chapter 14. Let me read you just two verse, or three verses here. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14 says this. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Now listen to what it says about him. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Did you notice the operative word there? Hmm? I. Did you notice that? Satan had eye disease. Okay? And it wasn't glaucoma, you know, or pink eye. It was self-deception. It was pride. Okay? Very important to understand. So, when he says, You'll be, I will be like the Most High, if you remember, this is the same lie that he tempted Eve with. If you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, God doesn't want you to do that because he knows that the day you eat of it, guess what's going to happen? You are going to become like God. Because he believed that. See, and he tempted her to believe that. And not only did it make him fall, right? Because what's the scripture tell us in Proverbs 16, 18? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Satan fell, and so did man. Because we believed we could be like God. Hmm. Interesting. So, this church, the church at Laodicea, had become, now get this, this is so important to understand, they had become more of a reflection of Satan than of the Son, Jesus. Okay? As Christians, people who take on that name, Christian, it is supposed to mean Christ-like. That's what it's supposed to mean. But this church literally has become more like the enemy, become more like Satan than it has become like Jesus because of their pride. Now, here's what's interesting. Those words, I am, right there, in Greek, here's the Greek word for those words, I am. Ready? I, me. It's the Greek word, I, me. I, me, is Greek for I am. But I think it's interesting. As English speakers, when I hear that Greek word, I, me, what's it sound like? I and me. It's all about me. And that is literally what it had become about at the church at Laodicea. It's become all about them. These words, I am, are very important because... I am were the words that described the Lord, Yahweh, in the Old Testament. Remember when Moses encountered God at the burning bush and God speaks to him through that manifestation and tells him to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go? Well, who do I say sent me? I am that I am. 
It's interesting. Those, those words in Hebrew, we, we, we try to pronounce it as Yahweh. We don't really know how it is actually pronounced. But those words, those Hebrew letters, yud Hey vav Hey, come from the Hebrew verb to be. And so when God declared himself as the I am, again, he's saying the same thing Jesus said. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end and everything in between. Okay? Yahweh in the Old Testament, the Lord, was known as I am. That's how he revealed himself to Moses. And that's the way that word is used in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus took on this title. Of course, in Greek, as I said, it's I, me, but he takes on this title himself. And in doing that, the Jews understood that he was making himself equal to God because he would say things like he and his father are one. And it would so upset them. And in fact, in the Gospel of John, if you go through the Gospel of John, you'll see seven deliberate different places where John records Jesus' seven I am statements where Jesus said things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Or he said things like, I am the true bread that came down from heaven. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I mean, and he goes on and on seven times. When Jesus was saying that, he was claiming to be God himself. God in human flesh. So what's interesting in knowing that, that means this church has replaced Jesus as the center of the church with themselves. Their church is no longer about the I am. It's about the I me, so to speak. You see that? Now, let me help you understand this with just a, a short story. There was a little country church that had a sign above its doorway the sign was beautifully made, and actually it was decorated with live ivy around it. And the sign read this way. It said, we preach Christ crucified. And when the church that gathers there came together, they understood why they were coming because of the sign. We, pre preach, we preach Christ crucified. Well, after a few years, the ivy started to grow, and it started to grow over the sign, and so the sign eventually, instead of reading, we preach Christ, it simply read, we preach, I'm sorry, instead of reading, we preach Christ crucified, it just said, we preach Christ, because you couldn't see the word crucified, because it was all grown over with ivy. And so, a few more years passed. The ivy grew to cover the sign even more. Until it read, simply, we preach. At that time in the church's history, the name of Jesus was seldom, spo seldom spoken of. Sin and the need for repentance was replaced with a more social, political, and moral gospel. And then after more time, the ivy grew so much that finally the sign said this. We. That's it. We. And that's what happened at the church at Laodicea. They slowly, through their self-deception and their pride, squeezed Jesus out until he's outside. And now the church is all about the people and what we want and what we have. See? So, what did they claim? Notice verse 17. Because you say or you allege with your inflated ego, I am rich. See that? The word rich here literally means unlimited wealth. Unlimited wealth. And enormous affluence. So, this isn't just a well-off church. This church is filthy 
rich. We would use in our terms. It was a church of unlimited wealth and enormous affluence. And notice Jesus says that they said, or they are saying in their hearts, I am rich and have become wealthy. You see those words, have become wealthy? What that means is this. It means that they were endowed with resources. This church had a lot of money. This church had a lot of stuff. This church had something for everyone. I mean, what is your desire? What is your issue? What is it you want? We've got it here for you. This church had enormous resources. And, and literally what this means in the context in which Jesus uses it, these words have become wealthy literally mean I have made myself rich. Now, is that arrogant or what? This is a church telling the Lord, we don't need you because we've got it all. We've got unlimited wealth. We've got enormous resources. Or we have enormous, enormous affluence. We're endowed with resources. And it's all because of what we've done. It's all because of what we've done. Now, if you remember, when we talk about the history of the city of Laodicea, Remember, Laodicea as a city was a financial center. Remember that? It was home to many bankers, financiers, and there was a lot of commerce in this city. Where most ancient cities had one or maybe two marketplaces, agoras or marketplaces, Laodicea had five that had almost 5,000 shops. Where most cities only had one theater, they had two. I mean, any city in Asia Minor compares itself to Laodicea, and it fails in comparison. It even gave the great city of Ephesus a, a run for its money in this area. It was a financial center. Number two, it was a fashion center. We talked about that. It was known for its textile industry that produced expensive clothing made from black sheep's wool. It was a fashion center. They made a lot of money when it came to clothing and selling their clothing. And number three, it was a physician center. The most famous ophthalmologist, eye doctor, in antiquity practiced in that city of Laodicea. They had a medical school that specialized in eye problems. And they had available to them because of their geographical location a powder called Phrygian powder that they would use and mix to make eye solutions and eye salves. And they were known all over the world for people coming there to get their eye problems healed. So this was a church, again, of unlimited wealth, enormous affluence, endowed with resources. And they say that they have become wealthy. I've made myself rich. Okay? Now, how does that line up with Scripture? It doesn't. It doesn't. Let me tell you what the Bible has to say. Just a couple of verses. For instance, Proverbs 10, 22. It says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. You realize that? The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. That's amazing. Because the scripture is, is very clear that God is good to both the just and the unjust. So never look at rich people who have everything and more, who are not Christians, and just assume, well, they got it by being wicked and cheating and stealing. 
Don't just assume that. Because the Bible teaches that God grants to all of us, both good and evil, just and unjust, a common grace where he gives to all of us everything that we need to survive, and even more so. Hmm. It's the blessing of the Lord that makes one rich. Every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven, from the Father of lights. And then how about this one? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Paul writes to the young pastor Timothy and says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. That means prideful. Okay? Well, why not? Well, he's going to tell us why. Number two, he says, Nor, tell them, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Well, why should you not trust in riches? You know, there's a proverb that actually says, that Solomon wrote and says, that riches and money are like a bird. Okay? They, they come for a while, and then with wings, they fly away. You ever notice that? Have you ever noticed in your life that right when you think you're getting ahead and you're putting some money in the bank, and you're finally getting to that place where you got a little nest egg and, man, things are looking good and you're starting to spend a little money on this and that. We're going to live a little better lifestyle. We're gonna... All of a sudden, that money just seems to fly away. The car breaks down or the house needs a new roof or, or maybe both at the same time. And a lot of things happen where all of a sudden the money's gone. The money's gone. It happens in a lot of different ways. Don't trust in riches because Paul called them uncertain. Paul says don't trust in uncertain riches. He says, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. There's another verse that says all that we have, God is the one who has given that to us. And he's given us these things to us for us to enjoy them. Listen, it's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to have things. It's a sin to let things have you. And you just start to think, I am somebody. I am, I'm thinking more of myself than I should. Actually, I'm thinking more of myself than what I really am because of what I have accomplished, because of what I have. That's pride. And that's, it's terrible for us to not recognize that everything we have has come from God, not from ourselves. Okay, listen. According to Scripture, there are no self-made men. There are none. Okay? We can, there's nothing we can boast about on our own. Yes, it is scriptural that we should have a good work ethic as Christians. Paul taught the Thessalonians, hey, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So yes, we should have a good work ethic. We should work hard. We should work smart. We should do all we can to make all we can. In fact, it was John Wesley who said, make all you can, save all you can, okay? And then he said, and give all you can. See, good advice. But here's the thing. What we have to remember is everything we have ultimately comes from God. And without him, we would have nothing. In fact, Paul told the Corinthians, I think we have 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul told the Corinthians, he says, Do you realize there's, there's nothing that you have that you didn't receive? In other words, if it weren't for God, you would have nothing. See? So we can't boast in the fact that, you know what? I have such a good work ethic. I get up early every morning. You know, I get up and I go to work and I work hard. Well, you should. The Bible says so. But here's the thing. You can't say because I do that, I'm a self-made man. I have everything I have because of me. You can't say that. You know why? Who do you think gave you the strength to get out of that bed every morning? Okay? To be able to do that, 
to go to work and to earn a living. Who do you think gave you the health? Let's even go farther than that. Who do you think even gave you the life to be able to do those things? The Lord. The Lord. And we can't boast about our education either. You know? Well, it's because of my degrees and how smart I am that I have everything I have. You know? Well, who do you think put that intelligence in you? Who do you think gave you that mind that you have that is so sharp? Hmm? God. Go down the list. There's nothing that we have that we haven't received. So there's no need for us or use for us to boast that, as they are saying here, I am rich. I have become wealthy. I've made myself wealthy. I've done all of this. No, it's the blessing of the Lord, and we must recognize that. And when we recognize that, the next thing we need to do is we need to give thanks to God for all that he has given to us. Listen, if you want to break your pride down, then be in a regular habit of thanksgiving, of daily in your prayer time, going to the Lord and thanking him, re rehearsing and reminding yourself of how good God has been to you. Because when you do that, you know what will happen? God, all of a sudden, in your eyes, will get bigger. And you will get smaller. And you will realize it's really all about him and not about us. See? Interesting, huh? Well, let's look at another part of this real quick before we end tonight. Notice what Jesus says they are saying at the end. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. You see that? That phrase... Have need of nothing literally refers to absolutely no need of nothing whatsoever. It's very precise. It's not just that we don't have a lot of needs. It's literally them saying to the Lord... We have absolutely no need of nothing whatsoever. And that would include Jesus. Okay? It would include Jesus. In fact, again, if you would look down at verse 20. This is why Jesus is on the outside of the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Why is he out there? Because they don't need him. They don't need him. And these are Christians in a church. See? Interesting. Abraham Lincoln, in one of his proclamations that he wrote to this nation, encouraging this nation during the Civil War to spend a day of prayer and fasting, wrote this. He said, and I quote, We have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Could you imagine a president speaking like that today? Isn't that amazing? Through the deceitfulness of our hearts, we have imagined that all these blessings we have was produced by some superior wisdom or virtue of our own. Boy, I tell you what, if Abraham Lincoln spoke that to the church at Laodicea, it wouldn't have been any less applicable. This is what's happened. They have forgotten Christ. They've forgotten Christ. Before we end today, I want, or tonight, I want to take you to two places as we close. Turn back with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
And I want you to see the words that the Lord had to say to the nation of Israel about this subject. Deuteronomy chapter 8, in verse 1, the Lord speaking to Moses to write these words down, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. That they were to remember this. Not forget it, they were to remember it. It says to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. So He humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. It's interesting today that, or at least, you know, in our culture in times past, we used to call money what? Bread. So he's telling Israel here, I on purposefully allowed you to hunger so you would know you need me. And I provided for you so that you would know. That it's not the things you have or don't have that's your greatest need. Your greatest need is me and my word. You live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And then he says this, And your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Imagine that. Their shoes, their sandals, and their clothes lasted for 40 years. That's something, huh? So their clothes were in style, went out of style, and came back in style by the time they went through the wilderness. God's good like that, isn't he? (laughs) And then notice, you should know in your heart that a man, that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Who's doing this? The Lord. And remember, this is his land that he's giving to them. So the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of a land of brooks of water, of fountains, of springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. I mean, the Lord's like, I'm giving you everything you need and then some. And when you have eaten and are full, hmm, look what he says, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land Notice this, which, who has given to you? He has given to you. This isn't because of you. It isn't because of your smart and your hard work and blah, 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 blah. The Lord is giving this to you. Isn't that amazing? And notice, he says in verse 11, beware. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Well, why? Why would he give us a warning to not forget him when we have everything we need and we're blessed? Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that have, I'm sorry, and all that you have multiplied, I'm sorry, and all that you have is multiplied, Look at verse 14. When your heart is lifted up. You know what's another word for that? Pride. If you read about Satan's fall in Ezekiel 28, it will describe him as one who lifted up his heart. And God tells his people here, beware 
when I bless you and you have everything you need, because what's going to happen is when you have everything you need, you're going to think you don't need me anymore. And you're going to get prideful. And you're going to think, you did this. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions, scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the land. Notice verse 17 now. Look at this. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hands have gained me this wealth. You see that? When God blesses us, and we forget where it came from. Okay, when he blesses us and we think we have everything we need to where we don't need it anymore, we start to think, I have all this because of me. I am rich. I've made myself wealthy. wealthy. I'm in need of nothing. And the Lord said, do not say that. Because everything you have is because of me and from me. Now look what he says here. He says, if you say this in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have, made me, have gained me this wealth, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is, look, here it is, ready? For it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant, which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you to this, this day, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. That sounds like the church of Laodicea, doesn't it? Amazing. Turn one last place and we'll close. New Testament, go with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And then we'll quit. Come down to verse 6. Now, first, in verse 4, Paul's talking about people here, and he says he is proud. Okay, just keep that in mind. Now come down to verse 6, just for time's sake. Look what it says. Paul's writing to Timothy and say, he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. You having a heart right with God and then living your life in a godly way and then being content, being satisfied with what you have, no matter how little or how much it is, is great gain. In other words, the person who is godly and content, regardless of what he has or doesn't have, has much more peace, much more satisfaction in life. He's a much richer man than the guy who has everything and doesn't know God, doesn't have a right relationship with God, and knows no godliness. Okay, just keep that in mind. Now look what he says here. He says in verse 7, here's, here's why. Here's why godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, right? I mean, how many of you, how many of you when you were born, you were born naked? Just one person, right? Okay, right, that's fine. <laughs> when I used to work back in Ohio at the job I had before I came here, one of the ladies in our office was pregnant. One of the guys from the factory came in the office one day and had a little discrepancy with her over something at work. And uh, so they were having a little, little scuff. And she was pregnant, and he looked at her, 
And here's what I heard down the hallway in some of my office. I heard, well, I hope your baby's born naked. <laughs> he was just that kind of guy, you know, and he, then he goes out. i just never forgotten that. <laughs> Think about that. We brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Okay? That's why you never see a hearse hauling a U-Haul behind it. You ain't taking nothing with you. Okay? Now look, verse 8. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Now granted, I know that in the first century when Paul's writing this, they don't have automobiles yet. See, we would look at that as modern day Americans and go, well, you need to expand that a little bit. Because to be honest with you, if you really read that verse and agree with it, you know, well, let me say it this way. I don't know, think there's any of us who would read this verse and agree with it. Because we, he doesn't mention a house. He doesn't mention cars or any of the other things that we think as modern-day Americans we need. See what I'm saying? So this is one of the verses in the Bible I don't like. I don't like that verse. Now, if you want to play holy and righteous and say, well, that's the word of the Lord. I love this verse. Well, then move out of your house and give your car away and just have food and clothes, and let's see how happy you are then, right? I'm just trying to put this in perspective, you know what I'm saying? Look what Paul says. With food and clothing, be content. Really, that's all you need. All, all you need is food to survive and clothe your naked body because nobody wants to see it, right? It's a, it, that whole thing, us, you know, the whole nakedness thing, that was a result of sin. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't even recognize either one of them were naked. So, anyway, it's very little, isn't it? With very little, be content. Look at verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So sometimes the desire to be rich and the way to try to get rich on your own will cause you to fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts. And also sometimes when you have a lot, that will cause you to go to be led into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful lusts because you have the resources in which to Satisfy yourself. But notice the end result is it drowns men in destruction and perdition. In other words, there are very few people on this planet that can handle prosperity. A lot of people have it, but very few can handle it. That's why the largest portion of people who win the big lottery, within three to five years, they're completely broke. They, just did, they didn't just lose all the millions they won in the lottery. They lost all that plus everything they had before that. You know why? They don't know how to handle money. They don't know how to handle having all of that. Very few people can handle prosperity. And then he says in verse 10, For the love of money, notice, not money itself, but the love of money is a root, not the root, but a root of all kinds of evil. There's all kinds of evil that happens on this planet because people want money. I want to be rich. Think of the drug cartels that are ruining people's lives. Think of all of these girls in the slave trade. It's all because of money. A lot of evil happens because of the love of money. It says, for which some have strayed from the faith. Now he's talking about Christians. He's talking about Christians here. Money, prosperity, has ruined the faith of many believers. Why? Because they think they don't need God anymore. I got everything I need. I have need of nothing, including Jesus. It says, they've strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Then in verse 11, he says, But you, O man of God, flee these things. 
flee these things. Flee the desire to be rich. Flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. You see that? Isn't that amazing? So when you think of all that and then you go back, which we're not going to do tonight, we're going to do it Sunday morning, go back and look at Jesus' words to this church. You know, you're useless. The church has become useless. And how does a church become useless? Through their pride. Through thinking they don't need the Lord. That they have everything within themselves and among themselves that they need. We can do it ourselves. And they left Jesus outside. So, we got to be careful. We got to be careful not to allow self deception to happen in our hearts. Because if self deception happens, and pride comes in. And we forget God. And we think it's all about us. We don't need anything. And eventually, when we think we don't need anything, eventually we will think we don't need the Lord. See? And so that was the issue at the church of Laodicea. Sad, isn't it? It's very sad. But these words are written for our admonition. They're written for our warning just as well as they were 2,000 years ago. That's why Jesus, at the end of each letter, will say, if any of you have ears, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches. So we need to listen to what he's saying to the church at Laodicea because sometimes it may fit us. Okay? And if it does, we need to take his advice that he'll give later and to repent. Repent.